Good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome to this very special event in the Society for Applied Microbiology's calendar. Today, we celebrate the scientific accomplishments of two outstanding colleagues whose scientific contributions have made and, and indeed continue to make a significant contribution to advancing the field of applied microbiology. And so to our first award, our most prestigious award, that of Fellowship of the Society for Applied Microbiology, is granted to those who have made a significant contribution uh, to advancing microbiology and science as a whole. Our previous recipients of this award include Lord Jim O'Neill, Sir David Attenborough, Professor Dame Sally Davies, and Nobel Laureate Professor Jennifer Doudna. We're delighted to bestow the award of our 2021 SFAM Fellowship to Professor Damon Glover. We're exceptionally grateful to you, uh, Professor Glover, for taking time from your schedule to be with us today. Brendan, President, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. It, it's a tremendous honor to receive this fellowship. Um, there's nothing more special than being recognized by your peers. And um, for me uh, to have uh, the fellows and the committees in, in SFAM decide to award me this fellowship is um, is indeed very special and it, if, if you like it just cements for me why microbiology is just the world that keeps on giving uh, it's you know microbiology as all of us know it, it's a wonderful thing it's full of excitement you know every day is different when you're working in microbiology being able to apply that knowledge is something very special indeed particularly in these days of uh, being able to address net zero challenges and so on where the microbial world is is so important. So um, I, I am truly honored and uh, I, I would also I'd like to thank you for the fellowship and you, you also sent me um, a, a gift in celebration of this, which which I'm looking at over my camera <laughs> now and will be a daily reminder, a very beautiful daily reminder um, of, of this fellowship. So Brendan, thank you very much indeed. Um, thank you very much indeed um, for your comments and congratulations once again on behalf of everyone at the Society for Applied Microbiology. Thank you. So um, every year the Society for Applied Microbiology awards the WH Pierce Prize, our most prestigious research award to an early career microbiologist who has made a substantial contribution to the science of applied microbiology. Each year, our members nominate individuals across all sectors of applied microbiology who they deem to have conducted outstanding original research or have made outstanding contributions to the field. I'm delighted to announce that the WH Pierce Prize for 2021 has been awarded to Brea Harrison, Associate Professor of Microbiology at the University of Warwick School of Life Sciences. On behalf of the Society for Applied Microbiology, I congratulate Freya Harrison on her outstanding achievements and for the award of the WH Pierce Prize 2021. Freya. Thank you very much, Brendan. It, to echo what, what um, Professor Glover said, it's such a tremendous honour to be given this recognition. Um, looking at the previous awardees of this prize and also the, the, the membership of SFAM, there's so many people whose, whose work I really respect and so to, to be acknowledged in this way is just is just so wonderful. We all have those days in science where we wonder if what we're doing is, is really useful at the end of the day. So to be given a prize for applied microbiology and to have the, the usefulness of what we're doing recognised is, is just such a wonderful thing. Um, and I'd especially like to thank as well the person who nominated me because she's someone who's actually been instrumental um, in making the ancient biotics work ready for those phase one clinical trials. Thanks Freya, that's that's wonderful. So um, just by way of, of uh, introduction, I just want to say thank you very much to our fellowship recipient and the recipient of the WH Pierce Prize for making themselves available for a question and answer session with members of our Early Career Scientist Committee. Today, we're pleased to be joined by Nikki Williams, who is the great granddaughter of Bill Pierce, whose name is, is on the WH Pierce Prize. Um, Nikki works for Alzheimer's Research UK. We also have Matt Koch, PhD student at the University of Plymouth, whose work is on mining deep sea sponges for novel antibiotics. And Zina Alfal from Queen's University Belfast, 
whose work is concerned with the airway microbiome composition in chronic lung infections. So I'll pass over to our early career scientist to ask the questions of the panel. I was wondering if you can tell us a bit about the journey from being a professor at the University of Aberdeen to being the chief scientific advisor for the president of the European Commission and a little bit about how that came about. Okay, nice to meet you two on, online, Matt. Um, okay, so your question, it's a short question, but it was a long journey. So, uh, I mean, I am uh, followed a very standard academic career, um, degree, PhD, postdoc, lectureship, and so on, and an incredibly rewarding one at that. But it was actually, I suppose, um, once my own laboratory was very well established and um, we were receiving recognition for the, for the work in our lab. Um, that, and, and I suppose at a difficult age in life, so it was probably my, my late 40s. And, you know, you have those moments where you think, hmm, am I going to do this exactly like this for the, for the rest of my academic career? And um, I've always had itchy feet and a curious mind. And I became more and more interested in how research and the knowledge generated by research, as well as the scientific method, how that can be used more widely in life for the benefit of society. Because as my own PhD student, sorry, my, my own PhD supervisor said to me when I, I was a student with him, and he was also a microbiologist, uh, Professor David Eller, um, he, he once said to me that research not communicated is research not done. And I, I never forgot that. He, he wanted me to write more papers, of course, but um, he was just talking about that wider thing about communication. And I suppose I realized looking at um, and not just our, our governments in, in the UK, but um, thinking about globally, how poorly knowledge which we generate through our research is used in making robust, efficient and effective policies for, for citizens, you know, whether that be in health, whether it be in environment, uh, whether it be in transport or, you know, which, whichever area. So I got very interested in that, but knew nothing about the political environment. So how I went from the lab to being, uh, I suppose, my first big role in that area was chief scientific advisor for Scotland, um, was really an accident. It was a colleague, another microbiologist, who saw an advert for uh, the first chief scientific advisor for Scotland, for Scottish government, the devolved government. And um, he said, you know, you would be good at that. And I, I just dismissed it. And, um, and then he said, no, honestly, have a, have a, at least have a look at it. So I had a look at it and I thought, well, that does seem interesting. And then, uh, then I thought, okay, I have a very successful research career. What's the worst that could happen if I, if I did this? And it was a part-time post. And the worst that could happen wasn't really very bad. So I thought, well, I, at least I could apply. And as they say, that the, the rest is history. Um, that first role was very exciting because uh, Scotland had never had a chief scientific advisor and I had never been a chief scientific advisor so I suppose neither of us knew what we were doing but I had the benefit of at least having you know all my attention focused on making something of that role and making it have impact and significance and um, and I, I have to say it was one of the most rewarding things I've ever done. I'd just like to say in conclusion, though, that I did have a safety blanket. So it was a part time role, which meant that, you know, two days a week, I still had my lab at that time at University of Aberdeen. And it was almost more of a safety, more than a safety blanket. It was like a, a sanity check that, you know, I was still in touch with the real world, which I would describe as the research world, rather than the world of politics, which is very odd and very peculiar indeed. So uh, it's really exciting for us as an ECS members to hear about your successful journey. So thank you so much. So my question is for Professor Glover. Uh, you have worked with and continue to work with many scientific and governmental organizations across your career. Which of these positions give you the most excitement at the moment? And can you tell us a bit about why? 
Okay, and nice to meet you too, Zina. Um, that's quite a difficult question. And I, I think it's because um, I, I do do a lot of things other, other than my work at University of Strathclyde. And in a way, um, I only do things that I find really exciting. So um, that, that's part of the selection process is to decide whether to say yes or no. It, it has to be something that I find really interesting. Um, I, I think in terms of the most rewarding things, uh, I chair the Carnegie Trust for the Universities of Scotland. And uh, Andrew Carnegie, who was a huge steel magnet, and a really interesting man, actually, because he had no education whatsoever. He was born in Dunfermline, a, a, a small town in, in Scotland. And um, when, when he died, he was probably, in today's standards, he would have been the richest man in the world. So he came from an incredibly poor background. And at the time of, uh, uh, I won't give you his whole life history, but around about when he was 15 or 16, so young, uneducated, uh, but his family were uh, going through hard times. And so he decided to emigrate to um, America. And to cut a very long story short, he, he made his fortune and he self-educated. So he, he used libraries and that he spent in his legacy was to fund many libraries and so on. Carnegie Mellon University uh, in, in the US uh, named after him, Carnegie Hall, and so on. Uh, he built the Hague Peace Palace in, in the Netherlands because that was so important to him. And he endowed the Carnegie Trust for the Universities of Scotland, uh, which aims to support the Universities of Scotland. And um, our mission has changed slightly, although still adhering to his legacy, in that what we do now is, is support disadvantaged, but very capable and able people to be able to pursue um, a higher education at university. And meeting those people and understanding, you know, life's been very easy for me. I, I just went to university and I ha had family support. A lot of people, um, so one, one guy I met, children, a single father, three children, um, was doing a degree, uh, working at the weekend and in the evenings also to bring in extra income and we were able to support him to be able to achieve getting um, an excellent degree which will change his life and that of his family that he's supporting. So there's an example of something for me which is exciting because you're seeing in real time the difference that you can make uh, as well as rewarding. Um, the, the, Final thing I would say to you out of, as I say, a whole set of things that I could talk about is where you can use your science, particularly in the developing world. And um, I'm on the board of, of two international uh, organizations, both of which use science in order to try and uh, improve uh, agriculture or to prevent uh, invasive species or, or whatever taking over in environmental situations and particularly um, the African Agriculture Technology Foundation which I, I've just stepped down from after six years supports smallholder farmers 85% of whom are women in, in African countries and we support them in order to use better uh, crop varieties in order to uh, produce more sustainable cropping without the input of uh, fossil fuel fertilizers and, and other additives. And one single growing season can transform a family from being on the breadline and maybe, you know, so this doesn't sound much, but you know, ma making, growing five bags of maize. These are big, like 60 kilo bags, but five bags of maize, which is just enough to keep body and soul together in a year, to producing 65 bags of maize in one single growing season, which was enough to me, and her name was Mrs. Masungo, and um, she used the seeds we gave her, and that allowed her to send her kids to school, where you have to pay a fee, she's based in Kenya, and also to build a house with sanitary, um, both uh, waste disposal and also uh, clean water into her house um, by sale of some of those bags of maize. That's in one growing season. That's the power of science. That's exciting. 
just wondering how how separate do the issues around public health and themes in scientific advancement feel in Scotland compared to the UK as a whole or um, or do you feel that they're quite closely aligned? I'd say generally they're they're pretty closely aligned. Um, I mean, obviously the the governments and the approach to government is is very different in in the UK government and the, the devolved governments in the UK. Um, the thing that is different is that in Scotland, um, policy around environment is devolved. So there are some things in the devolved governments um, where powers are devolved, such as in health and uh, in environment. And there are some things uh, which are uh, reserved and those things would be things like foreign policy and you know uh, various other things like that so in environment is I suppose an interesting one because it does mean that in Scotland we see environment being treated uh, differently um, because it, it has a different priority in Scotland um, presumably because voters feel differently about the environment perhaps than they do in the rest of the UK and, a, and an example I could give you is, is perhaps around the, the difference in attitude towards uh, genetically modified crops. So um, since Brexit, uh, the UK government has stated that it wishes to see GM crops being grown and, uh, and so on, uh, at, at least in England. In Scotland, because that's a reserved issue, um, that is unlikely to happen in Scotland because Scottish government have, have stated very strongly that they are against um, growing GM crops. And it's a really interesting issue and probably not, not, not one that we've got the time to talk about here. But um, it, I think it reflects that in Scotland, and it would be interesting, I, I don't know if this has ever been done, is just asking citizens in Scotland versus say in England or, or, or Wales or Northern Ireland, whether they, they would like to see GM crops cultivated. My hunch would be that across the UK, mostly citizens, I, I would say probably more than 50% would say, no, we don't want GM crops. Because actually there's been, there's been a lot of, if you like, fake news and false information that has been uh, spread about this, that the technology is dangerous, that we don't know enough and so on. Whereas from a scientist's point of view, um, because of the very forensic nature of genetic modification when it comes to, for example, crops uh, production, new crop strain production, um, we know exactly what we're doing, but with historical plant breeding, we hadn't a clue what we were doing. We, we didn't know what genes we were manipulating or modifying just through the natural process. And indeed, many of the crops that we uh, consume today were produced by radiation mutation of um, existing crop species and then selection for something that looked a bit better. So we selected for a positive attribute, but we didn't know what other negative attributes might have happened, such as production of allergens or whatever. Whereas GM technology is so tightly regulated that in fact you know about everything that you're doing so your state of knowledge about those particular strains are much greater which I suppose takes you down to the the, the question then what do citizens want and I I think um, what citizens are never given is, is all the information so governments tend to react often to what they think citizens want um, I think in the case of uh, the one difference that I'm thinking between uh, Scotland and rest of the UK with GM, what would be really good if governments, for example, the government in Scotland said that the technology is safe and here are the attributes, we you know we can grow crops, I would call them GM organic crops so that you would uh, modify crops so that they could grow without the input of fossil fuel um, fertilizers and, and so on, you know, fertilizers derived from the use of fossil fuel. Um, and I, th I think then you would say the technology is safe. These are the advantages. Would you like to consider the growth or not? And if they still say not, well, then we shouldn't we shouldn't grow them if that if, if citizens don't want them. So there are there are some subtle differences. But um, I, I, I think uh, and and you do notice those differences, I, I, I guess, when you when you know both systems. 
But overall, I would say two systems are very similar, Matt. Sure, yeah. Great, that's really interesting. Thanks. Yeah, I guess I guess like you say around um, the public kind of um, view of it, where you know where people hear the word GM or you know because of certain news stories and stuff, it kind of strikes fear into people. So it's really interesting to hear the the kind of the conversations around around um, what it actually means and how it could be potentially portrayed differently. Yeah, yeah so and, and actually just to say, I mean, almost all of the pharmaceuticals, the vaccines, for example, the current pandemic that we use have been um, have been produced using GM technology. And GM food is a really odd one because it's the one example of where it isn't the food that's regulated, it's the technology used to produce the food. Now, if you regulated the technology used to produce drugs, we wouldn't have any drugs in the market. It's just, it's just too complicated. So it's a really weird thing. And it's, and it's where misinformation has taken over from uh, evidence and, and knowledge produced by science. So it's a good example of how things can go horribly wrong if you don't communicate well from the outset. You are often cited as being a strong proponent of evidence-based policy making, uh, something that many scientists would uh, probably support. Uh, the need for good evidence is also something that's been highlighted by the current pandemic, as you were saying just now. Um, could you perhaps speak a bit about why this is so important and whether you think we're seeing steps towards more evidence-based uh, decision making in our government? Okay, so um... It's lovely to meet you, Nikki. Particularly, it's it's lovely to meet you, and, and I know it is for Freya as well because you're the great granddaughter of, of Bill Pierce. So it's it's just it's just lovely to have that link. So um, that's a, a special addition to today's wonderful event. But um, okay, so evidence based policy making is it important? Absolutely. Why is it important? Because you don't want to be making policies on a hunch, or I would argue a philosophy, because um, then it's based on, you know, it's like building a house on sand. It's on very fragile ground and it can easily be attacked. Whereas if you have something built on evidence, then you're using that knowledge that, uh, let's face it, the public pay for, because mo most of us on this call, the public pay for the research that we have done or that we will do. And so they deserve to see the positive benefit of that. So if if scientists produce evidence, and it's not just, you know, and I'm talking about scientists in the wider thing, also social scientists, terribly important that, that we listen to the output of that. And um, so if we generate that publicly funded knowledge, we have an obligation to use it. And I, I feel very strongly about that. And I think politicians let citizens down if they do not have evidence evidence-based or evidence-informed policy, at least. Um, and you're kind of saying, you know, are we getting better at it? Well, I'm a natural optimist in, in life, and I, I think we might be getting a little better at it. Is it good enough? No, it, no, it isn't. And uh, uh, let me let me say, you know, should, should every policy be evidence-based? Well, Probably not, and, and here's, that might surprise you. I'll, I'll give you one example. I was uh, on a working group once, and it was looking at the detection and decontamination of chemical and biological weapons. So what sort of policy should we have to be able to detect and decontaminate if there was, let's say, a terrorist attack? And we used an example of a white powder incident in the London Underground. Now, if you if you put a powder into London underground, because the tubes move around, it's a bit like a hypodermic syringe. And so that white powder gets everywhere. So what would we do if there was such an incident? And the bottom line is, in order to minimize possible death or harm to the maximum number of people, the best thing to do scientifically, and all the evidence pointed to this, would be to seal the tube and anyone down there, seal them down there. And that would prevent any white powder or, you know, and it could be a virus or toxins being spread in an aerosol above ground. So that's what the evidence says. Is that what the policy is? No. 
Uh, and it's that's not the policy because scientists are human beings too. <laughs> and in a way, if you did that, you're as bad as the terrorist who was trying to, you know, to generate that terror in the first instance. So what we have is a policy that tries to minimize harm, but does not do the thing that would actually maximize the reduction in harm. And I think that's right. You know, as a scientist, I can say, well, I know that the evidence doesn't completely say that, but that is the right way to take in other strands of knowledge or evidence. It's not just scientific evidence to generate a policy which is fit for purpose. Um, but maybe my last word on, on the issue would be where, where politicians let us down as citizens and as scientists is where they misrepresent the evidence. And I'm going to go back to what I was saying to Matt around GM. You'll often hear politicians saying, oh, we don't know enough about GM or it could be dangerous. Well, there is, that's nonsense. So um, what they should be is transparent about the evidence to say, you know, we have evidence, but for other reasons, which might be ethical, philosophical, economic, social, or whatever, we're not either using that evidence or we're modifying the use of the evidence. Um, and I think that, you know, that, that would be, we would all feel the benefit of that if we were to do that. And so the onus is on us in some way as scientists to try and keep communicating and to make it easy for policymakers and for politicians to use the evidence because we will all benefit from that. So um, I will continue with that crusade whilst I'm still breathing. Uh, my next question is that you were once voted as the 19th most powerful woman in the UK. Can you tell us about some of your ongoing work in supporting women in STEM? Uh, okay, thanks, Zina. Um, I always think the 19th is a bit incongruous, isn't it? It's, it's like I just sneaked in, you know, because it would probably be the top 20 or something. Um, and of course, it's always nice to be on those lists and it gives all your friends a good laugh. And um, But I, I think um, it's good for women to be visible. And one thing, you've probably all heard this phrase, but you need to see it to be it. So it's very important that, that women who achieve things, actually anyone who achieves things is visible and vocal about it. Um, because if you don't see things, it's very ha hard to aspire to them. And, you know, I, so, so maybe, maybe I shouldn't admit to this, but when I was, um, I, I guess I'm looking at you near your age, I was painfully shy. And I, I, I wouldn't speak publicly and I would do almost anything to get out of, you know, standing up and talking about something or whatever. I, and there came a point where I thought, well, you know, if I'm not going to speak about the things that are really important, no one else seems to be speaking about them. So, uh, and one of the things that bothered me was I, I could see even at a very early age, not that I was treated badly, that, but that people's expectations of me were just different simply because I was female. Um, you know, they said, oh, you, I can remember um, a tutorial, a, a highly respected scientist in a tutorial group where I happened to be the only woman, but he, he went around each one of us saying, what do, you, what do you think you'll do with your degree and so on? And he came to me and he just said, oh, no point in asking you, you'll get married and have kids. So, and then he moved on to the next person. And I was just so angry because I thought, are you so stupid that you would spend your time educating me? And you think that not that there's anything wrong with getting married and having children, but that I shouldn't use the education that you gave me. And I, I just, I thought, okay, enough's enough. <laughs> and so um, I've always tried to, uh, for me, diversity is hugely important. And it isn't just around gender or it, it's, it's also around ethnicity, disability, uh, background, uh, all of these things. Uh, and science is wonderful. Science is totally blind to all of that as a discipline. Couldn't care less, you know, whether you're male, female, um, have got no limbs or four limbs or whatever. Science is interested in your mind and your thinking. Uh, couldn't care less about your accent either. So in a way, we need people, but scientists are slightly different because, of course, some of them 
do have prejudices. I, I'm sure I'm not without prejudice myself, and you have to be aware of that. But so I continually I mentor women. I also mentor men, young men, because um, it's it. I, I just think it's very important to understand life from different perspectives. So if women only hear from women and men only hear from men, it's a little bit it's a little bit limited. The other thing that I always do, Zina, is that if somebody says to me, um, would you like to nominate someone for X, Y, or Z, or can you suggest someone for a board or whatever? Um, I always give myself the challenge of that the first two people that I nominate will always be women. And then I, I might nominate a third or a fourth or a fifth, and they can be men or women. But I will always try and make visible people who I think are very good. I don't nominate people who I don't think, you know, are up to the whatever the job is, because uh, I'm not really in favor of kind of that quota system. But I will always put the names forward and nominate them. And to men, so here's my challenge to men. I mean, often if I'm at a conference or uh, or on a panel or whatever, um, I know that if I'm on the panel, at least there'll be some gender diversity if not balance you know if I'm on it uh, you know unless it's all women which is that's no I've never come across that but um so that's a good thing but when men are asked I would ask men always to say what's your diversity on the panel and if the panel is all male is to say I'm sorry I'm not I'm not I don't want to contribute if it's all male I would happily give up my place yeah, for a female colleague and here's a good name of one now I, I know a lot of my male colleagues who do that and um, and I really applaud them for doing it because it's sometimes not easy when you want to be on the panel or you know or you think it's, it's a good thing to do um, so 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 in conclusion then Zina I'd say is um, at the moment what I try to do is is make women and their achievements um, visible and to, to make it very difficult for people to ignore uh, the contribution that that wider diversity that can make, because we all benefit from diversity. Men, it's, it's a win-win situation. So why would you not want to do it? Yes, that's, uh, I really agree with you. And this, you're, you're really an inspirational woman. And I think also it's very important that what you have said to be applied in developing countries, because I think here they reach a good stage, but and still in developing countries, they think that women, as you said, or as that, that person told you before, that they are just for marriage and getting kids, but they don't know that I trust that always women can balance between both. So you will not only be a scientist or only be a ha like uh, have kids and be married, you can do, you'll be great in both and women have the power to be great in both things. So uh, absolutely. Thank you so much. Just to go back to your um, introduction to that question, um, you mentioned that being 19th is a little bit um, incongruous and that it's usually the top 20. Funnily enough, the 20th person was actually Nicola Sturgeon. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that caused any um, funny conversations around the, the coffee machine, but I mean, it's great to see the, the recognition in the list, you know, in, in either way. But yeah, it's... Yeah, well, I've, I think I've, I've definitely dropped off the list now, but she'll still be there. <laughs> <laughs> um. As a, as a final question, um, our ECS members always like to hear from our fellows and other successful scientists. So just wondering what advice you would give to some of our ECS members who might be starting their careers in science? Uh, okay, um, be fearless, take risks. Um, I always, you know, I, I didn't take very many risks when I was younger, which I think is, is counterintuitive. I think you're meant to be very into risks when you're younger. I wasn't, maybe it was because I was shy and very retiring, I guess. But um, as I got older, I took more and more risks because if you don't take any risks in life, there is no reward uh, or very little reward, you know, that it's exciting. And I don't mean to take risks without, um, you know, analyzing. So I always, I always, I, I, I said this earlier, I always say to myself when considering something that would be a risk, what's the worst that can happen? Now, if the worst that could happen is you could easily die, I don't, I don't take that risk. So I, I'm not into jumping out of planes without a parachute or, or whatever. So that, that's not what I mean. But 
it's, ha it's having a look at things and thinking, if it did go wrong, what have I got a fallback position? And you know, normally there always is something, there's a fallback position or there's someone you can share the risk with. Uh, that you could, I, I love working with others. So collaboration is a tremendous joy and it's something that all of us um, can benefit from in, in research. Um, and uh, and I, I, would all, I would also say, so taking risks, uh, being bold and thinking, you know, sometimes you think where you're working, it's not quite right or this isn't, or nobody's, let's say you think mm, there isn't a big enough voice for say, uh, graduate students or young researchers where I'm working well my challenge would be or, or my advice is well think about changing it yourself because the senior person where you are isn't thinking about you all the time they're probably still thinking about themselves so you need to think about you and your life and what would make your life better and what you would find interesting and exciting and then just invent it and do it um, so the bit of advice I was given around that was when I first joined Scottish government and the then permanent secretary said to me, again, a well-known phrase, um, he said, um, ask for forgiveness, not for permission. So, so don't, don't be a may I do this or whatever, do it. And then if it goes horribly wrong, say, oh, I'm very sorry about that. You know, I won't do that again. And I really took that to heart. Uh, because, you know, sometimes just doing stuff makes a huge difference because others are too busy, too uninterested, uh, whatever to do it. But you can make a big difference by doing that. And uh, by and large, I, I, I don't want to generalize too much. And I'm mindful of my own age, uh, which is uh, greatly advanced in years compared to anyone else on here. But um, Sometimes younger people have much better ideas. You know, there's there's less conformity has has crept into your lives, and you see greater possibilities. And and older people can benefit hugely if you just take control and do things. So, so that would be my challenge: is just just get on and do it, um, and be supportive. Do it for yourself, but always look around. And if someone nearby needs a hand up and a help give them it because people have long memories and I know in my own life where I've I've helped people without thinking too much about it and then at a later stage I've I've really been in a hole and needed someone and that helping hand has always been there for me because people remember so that would be my advice and good luck and have fun most importantly have fun my question to you is, um, from a personal perspective, what would you advise to people that are at that sort of mid stage of their career, perhaps in their forties, if their laboratories are established? What what advice would you give to people in that position? So I think I, I know we're all different, you know. So this advice would be more for people like me, and I, I don't even know how to define what people like me are. But um, I said before, I. I'm not the usual scientist and even during all my research career, I didn't focus on one thing and only research on that one thing. I find lots of things very interesting. And my, my challenge was always to try and narrow down what I was doing. But that broader perspective for me um, introduced me to lots of different people and lots of different possibilities, which is, is what, um, what fuels me. You know, that, that's, that's really what gives me energy. And, my advice at that stage in your career, because I think by that stage, you know that you're successful. You know, you know that you've achieved what you hoped that you would be able to do. Um, you know, you, you might think you might have a, a chair, for example, be a professor. And, and for most people, that's giving you some sort of at least the recognition that your peers think that you've done a good job, that you're publishing good papers, that you're getting research grant income, that you've got brilliant students that are your legacy in, in some way. Um, my advice would be is just look a little bit wider because you need to lift your eyes up from the research that you're doing, which of course is all consuming. And you need to think about who would find that research interesting. And that might be, it might be a company, it might be a policy maker, it might be a, a TV company, it might, 
you know, it might be um, a citizens group of some sort who want to share in the excitement of what we do. And I, I think, um, ironically, my first external role, um, which was before that, that point, I think it must have been late 30s or early 40s, was as a council member for the Microbiology Society. And it was my first time doing something not, not just for me, if you like, but for my community. And that was transformational for me because I, I saw what a difference you could make, even just lobbying uh, parliamentarians who think microbes are, are things that kill you rather than, you know, there's a tiny proportion that can kill you. So I, I'm not going to pretend otherwise, but it's vanishingly small because the bulk of them, the 99.99% make our world work and produce products and processes and uh, opportunities that you could only ever dream of uh, as a non-microbiologist. So I think at that stage in your career, your research can also be stimulated by just, I don't know, just lifting your eyes up a bit and looking at what, how you could contribute in a wider way. For example, with SVAM, what a nice way to start, you know, that would be great for, for a lot of researchers to think about, you know, could I play a role there? But then, um, you know, small companies are always looking for scientific advisors, um, uh, governments and uh, advisory panels and things looking for people who just have knowledge of the scientific method, who think the way we think, we think it's normal, but it's not actually that widespread. So we, we do have something uh, to contribute to society. And it's so rewarding um, because you just know that you're making a difference. So, so Brendan, I would, I would say just, you know, push yourself out of your comfort zone. Your, your research will not suffer. It will benefit. Thanks very much. That's, that's great advice. Wonderful to hear your perspective on that. Um, Okay, I think um, that said, we can, uh, and apologies to the panel for nipping in with a question of my own there. Um, we'll maybe move on now to the questions uh, for Freya. So my, my question is, where did the idea to test ancient remedies come from? The idea to test the, the ancient medicines, well, we're, we're by no means the first people who've had this idea, you know, there've been people making remedies from around the world from historical and traditional medicine and testing them for a while. And I first became aware of the idea of making some of these medieval European remedies when I happened to read a really interesting paper by a professor of English from the US called Mike Drought. And he had collaborated with an archeologist, I think, to make some of the, the early medieval um, Anglo-Saxon English remedies and test them. And he very kindly sent me an off print of this paper. And I thought, you know, this, this is really fascinating as a microbiologist, this is something I'd really love to do at some point in the future. And I didn't have the capacity to, to think more about it at that time. So I filed it away in my mind. And it wasn't until I was doing this postdoc at the University of Nottingham that I happened to meet Christina Lee in the School of English there. Um, I actually gate crashed one of their Old Norse reading groups out of out of nerdy interest. And we talked about our, our mutual interest. She was quite excited that a scientist had engaged with humanities in that way. And she said, you know, we should really talk about our respective research at some point because she's interested in the, the history of, of death and disease. And I said, really because a while ago i read this paper about making and testing some remedies and we could do that we've we've got all the facilities in the lab we've perhaps got better facilities than you know the teams who are doing this as experimental archaeology had um and i was incredibly lucky to be working for a really really supportive pi at that time steve diggle who said yeah sounds fantastic you know have a bit of time have a bit of space go ahead and do it and so it really came out of, of, I guess, having conversations with people. And this, this resonates with a, a, a lot of, of what Professor Glover has said about how important it is to, uh, to, to network, to talk to people, to make collaborative links, because you never know where they're going to lead. And so this really came out of those sort of chance engagements with different kinds of research and conversations with people. Um, and, and here we are several years later, and it's grown into a research programme. 
I really find it fascinating how you've merged um, history and science as well. I feel like that's um, quite a, not not an usual uh, a usual combination, but it works so well together. And um, I guess we've had quite a bit of a discussion about interdisciplinary concepts as well. So just to say, I found that really interesting. So. <laughs> Um, yeah, just echoing what the other guy said, it's really fascinating to read around kind of your your work and the ideas that went into it when we're kind of putting stuff together for our magazine. So yeah, it's really, really interesting to read about. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering if you have any clues as to the active agents in the uh, in the bullseye self yet? So this is the million dollar question really, isn't it, Matt? And this is, this has really had us scratching our heads because we're looking for several needles in a haystack. If you imagine the, the number of plant secondary metabolites that we've got in some of those ingredients um, in the eye salve, we really need to then narrow that down because you 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 know the the real motivation behind your question is you you can't say to people I've got this fantastic mixture of garlic onion bile and bile and wine mix it up and put it on a patient you've got to actually have something that's reproducible known dosable um, and we do have some idea of what's going on in there so I can't give too much detail at this point because we haven't published it. But we've been, or mainly my fantastic PhD student Jess and our collaborator at Nottingham, Don Kim, um, have been doing some chemical dissection and also looking at effects on bacteria. So I can say that there's, there's more than one active, um, active molecule in there that we need, which is very interesting. And we are starting to be able to make a semi-synthetic reduced version of the eye salve um, where we can quantify a bit more what's, what's in there. And we're applying for funding at the moment to really take that chemical dissection, you know, down to brass tacks and really work out what's the um, smallest combination of some of these active molecules um, or potentiators in that mix. And can we then formulate that into something you could put into uh, an ointment or an advanced wound dressing? Yeah, I guess it's like it looks simple on the surface when you just think one, an onion, some wine, garlic, that looks very simple. Then it becomes yeah. complex when you think about the number of plant secondary metabolites. So then it's interesting to see how how much that then becomes reduced and how simplistic it actually is. Yeah. When, yeah what's going on? That's kind of. That's and, and some of our early assumptions about that were wrong, because when we first looked at the remedy, the original recipe said to put it in a brass or a bronze vessel for nine days. And we thought what you're doing is making a weak acid. And if you put that in a pot made of a copper alloy, you're extracting copper salts. And that's probably what will be giving it any activity. And actually, we found that the, the brass or bronze was the one thing you didn't need for full activity. And it was actually nothing to do um, with, with those copper compounds at all. Um, some candidate molecules in the garlic have been very well studied. So for instance, allicin or ajoin, and we've shown it, it isn't simply the presence of those in this mixture that explains the activity, it, it is far more complex. So where is the eye salve currently with regards to clinical or preclinical development? So I'm really glad you asked that question, Zena, because it's, it's been a really exciting year because we did this first phase one safety trial of the eye salve. And this was still working with the, the kind of the raw mixture, not the synthetic cocktail. Um, and we have completed a safety trial on healthy human volunteers. So we obviously did a lot of lab work before we were allowed to do that. So we did some um, in vitro, ex vivo and, and animal model tests with our collaborators. But we did get to the point where we got, I think, 119 people this year. Um, and we asked them to wear a sticking plaster infused with the eye salve um, on their upper arm for two days and to report any adverse effects. And we had some very, very promising results. So that that work is is in review at the moment. So hopefully we'll come out soon. And it was it was great because we actually found more people reacted to the glue on the dressing we used than reacted to the actual eye salve itself. So that that again tells you something about the weird chemistry that's happening in this mixture, because if you simply mash up raw garlic and put that under a plaster on your skin, you can get third degree burns. You know, there are clinical case reports of, you know, why it's really bad to make a garlic plaster. Um, so that's, that's, again, telling us something about what's happening when you mix some of these natural products together, that we get something that has quite a, an interesting biological activity. We really hope the next tranche of funding um, is going to move us really into the, the firmly preclinical 
stage of testing, what we really want to do once we can get these uh, known combinations of active compounds and a formulation is that we really could then go into pilot testing on people with, say, uh, a diabetic foot infection um, or an infected burn wound and actually look for, for um, real human activity. So um, in your talk, you mentioned that um, all the rigorous testing you did, but um, just wondering, do you think that in his time, uh, Bold would have discovered that the iSalve worked through trial and error, um, empirical testing, or just by happy coincidence? Oh, thanks, Nikki. I wish I had a time machine and I could find this out because finding how these early physicians worked would be absolutely fascinating. And we don't know, you know, it's not like they've left a record saying I tried this on some patients, whereas if you look at, you know, the, the early um, Arabic scholar Ibn Sina, he does actually say, I put this on two people and this on two people and I looked what happened, and we don't have that record um, for Bald. And this is something that some of the more humanities based research is trying to get by looking at the similarities and differences between different remedies in the same book or in books from different countries at the same time. Can they work out how knowledge was transmitted and that does that suggest people would, were experimenting in some way. I think it's kind of tempting to suggest they may have been because there are similar remedies that are a bit simpler in the same books and other books from the same period. So some of those combinations of ingredients crop up again in different infection remedies, but not all of them together, which does make you think, were they thinking, okay, well, you know, A and B seem to help some people and C and D seem to help some other people. What if we put them together? You know, is that just part of, of human nature? I think they must have been experimenting in some way, you know, to have worked out that you could do this or to have worked out that you could um, extract indigo dye from woad or make high carbon steel, there's got to be some experimentation and trial and error, even if it's not what we would recognise as scientific method today. I just wonder what the situation is with regard to patenting and ownership of remedy that you find in an ancient manuscript. Thanks, Matt. That's, so that's a question that I'm really trying to get my head around myself, because this is the first time that my research has actually got to the point that I've had to think about that and engage with, you know, tech transfer offices about how would we do this? And I think, you know, that the whole remedy of Bold's ISAP has effectively been in the public domain for what, for probably 1100 years. So you couldn't patent that. What we do think is once you've got a mixture of active compounds, of active molecules that you can put together into something that, that is a formulation, as long as that's not been done before, then you do have something that could be patented. And there's examples of this. So there's a mix of flavonoids from citrus peel called citrox, which is used um, as an antibacterial agent and is patented in the US. And there the patent isn't the molecules themselves. It's the combination of particular molecules in a particular ratio that is a, a patentable formulation. So I think that's the, the route that we would go down. Uh, do you know of any groups in the UK working with indigenous groups to test mixtures for their antimicrobial potential? Yes, yeah, there, there are plenty of groups who do that. So I know just this year, uh, a group at UCL got some really interesting collaborative funding with a university in um, Guatemala to work with uh, Mayan community groups about various aspects of their sort of interactions with the natural environment, but also about their medical tradition as well. Um, and a really fascinating colleague in the US, Cassandra Quave, has just brought out a book about how she does this and how she engages with indigenous people in the Americas and also with community groups around the Mediterranean as well. Um, and how you work with with people to explore their their medicines, because it's it has to be that that conversation and collaboration with the people who are using it, right? You know, we've we've been in a very easy position when we're looking at historical medicine. Um, it's very different if you're working with something that a living community today is using and is part of their um, cultural capital or genetic heritage. Um, but yes, people are doing that. And there's some really, really interesting work. And I would 
absolutely put in a plug for Cassandra's book, The Plant Hunter, because it's such a, a beautiful explanation of how this kind of work proceeds. That's great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Apart from the use of the eye salve, um, are you also looking for other potential remedies in ancient texts? Uh, are there any that you've got your eye on in particular? So we've, we've just finished um, a big collaborative grant focusing on stinging nettles, vertica species, and that's really been a cross disciplinary um, effort led by Christina Lee and that's involved um, some of the things that we were talking about earlier so looking at how different people in different times and places use those ingredients and that might suggest knowledge transmission but also doing some testing of some of the remedies in the lab as well um, and that's been kind of the opposite end of this research from the the crazy success of the ice elf because we found that we can't get any useful antibacterial activity out of nettles at all however we prepare them um, but we've got a very interesting systematic review showing the lack of evidence for this um, just uh, in review at the moment um, so that that has been you know the, the other end of uh, the, the scale of success but looking a bit more widely what the eye salve got us thinking when we realized that the anti-biofilm activity was this sort of synergistic function of the whole combination of ingredients it made us think are some of the remedies in these historical books giving us clues to the right natural products we should be putting together in the lab? Because as scientists, we tend to focus, you know, if we're thinking about a plant traditionally used in medicine, we tend to think, okay, we'll take that single plant, we'll do a whole load of solvent extractions, and we'll look, for, we'll find the individual molecule that's responsible for some useful behaviour. And when you actually look at historical and traditional medicine, you tend to find complex mixtures of different ingredients. And we think perhaps there's something in that. Are you finding in, you know, um, natural products that work together to kill bacteria or perhaps something that has useful antibacterial activity and something that reduces toxicity or acts as a, an emollient if you're applying it to a person? And so what we've been doing from that point of view is rather than picking these individual remedies that look interesting, um, this is with Erin Connolly and Chara Del Genio, we've been saying, let's treat these books as databases and let's mathematically look for patterns. Can we find if, there, if, if everything's totally random and everything's just thrown together, or if there's some pattern, do we find pairs or triplets of ingredients that are put together and assigned specifically to treat infection more often than we'd expect by random chance. And you can do that by using this tool from, from maths and computing called network theory or graph theory. So you can find these statistical clusters of ingredients and say, aha, these things are repeatably combined and they're not just put in any kind of remedy. They seem to specifically be allocated to skin infection or to mouth ulcers or whatever you happen to be looking at. And I think that for me is is the most sort of promising thing for the future. I think that's going to give us some really good ideas of what natural products we should bring into the lab and put together and test. And it's thrown up um, some really interesting sort of gaps in in what we're doing as microbiologists at the moment. So we've just started to look at two particular natural products, which in isolation have been very, very well studied and we find they co-occur in a lot of these remedies and we cannot find a single published study from the modern literature where people have put these two things together. Thanks very much everyone um, to Matt, Zena and Nikki. That concludes our formal questions at uh, part of the of, of today. Um, I just want to thank uh, Anne and Freya again for their time and also to our panel for, for, for very probing questions. Um, I'd like to give the opportunity, perhaps, we've never had a panel with, with two awardees on it, two of our recipients of our award. So I just wonder, perhaps Anne or Freya, have you a question for one another? I, I was just reading a bit about your own background and um, I heard that you were inspired uh, to get into this area by your interest in medieval sword fighting. And yeah. uh, it, it was a throwaway comment that, you know, not many people would know this about me. And I thought, well, that's an under, that's an understatement. But um, tell us a bit about the medieval sword fighting. So, yeah, this, this is how I spend a lot of my weekends. Um, so I decided it'd be really good fun 
so you to, to learn how to sword fight this probably comes from reading a lot of fantasy fiction you know as a teenager um and it it's it's a really interesting sport and it's basically an excuse as an adult to have fun with your friends uh, and play with weapons so yeah i i spend a lot of time uh playing with short swords and daggers and spears and axes um and it, it's a fantastic way to keep fit i really recommend it <laughs> Okay, so I real keep fit with fun, but do you know what? I just thought it was such a great example of, you know, if you, I, I've, I've done this, asked small primary school children to describe a scientist. I say, you know, there's a scientist behind that door, a microbiologist, describe that scientist to me. And it's always, oh, it's always a man, uh, often with a beard and thick glasses and a white coat and often Wellingtons. And, you know, it's quite, quite an odd uh, image for kids young kids to have in their mind and I, I asked them the question what do they do at weekends and they say well they're still in their lab it's very smelly in there and they don't have any friends so I, I just think what you've described is a really good example you know scientists are just like everyone else and uh, and often a bit more creative and fun so so thanks yeah. for answering that and well, congratulations thank again thanks like, yes science, scientists are people is just such an important message to get across in so many ways isn't it yeah absolutely mm -hmm. how did you find sort of learning a new language to speak policy rather than science how how sorry this is, this is a massive question but how do you actually go about starting to learn how to talk to policymakers, the kind of things they want to listen to, what they prioritise. Um, do you know, it's a little bit like your answer to the last question, you know, you know, treating manuscripts and things like databases and trying to see if there's any common pattern and things. And um, th this might be a bit of a, a simplistic way of, of talking about it, but I remember when I was um, when I was chief scientific advisor for Scotland, I suggested to the then, the person who had science in their portfolio, that it would be a good idea if we met up, you know, once every couple of weeks, even if just for 15 minutes for me to talk through important things I thought are important and so on. And every time that meeting came up, I would be on my way to that person's office and the phone would go to say it had been canceled. And I, I thought, well, obviously they don't want to meet me. It's not a priority for them. And I tried to think, what, how can I make it a priority? And so I looked to see what was important to that person. I looked at their speeches. So, you know, just kind of analyzing the database, if you like. I looked to see uh, how they reacted, where they gave a really good speech and what it was. And, okay, here's my very crude analysis. Um, the next time I met that person, not at a scheduled meeting, because as I say, they, they never used to come to those, but it was at an event where we were both appearing. And I said that on the edges of that event, you know, science could make you look good. And ever since then, they, well, at that time, they took my meetings because they thought, okay, there's something in this for me that I can talk about, well, particularly, you know, Scotland is a very impressive science nation. Uh, the UK is impressive, but if you actually dissect Scotland out, it's um, the impact of research in Scotland is, is number one in the world relative to GDP. It's astonishing, really. We're very research intensive, and yet no politician was getting the benefit of that. And when I highlighted that, then I became... I wouldn't say little miss popular it, it, it didn't ever stretch that far but they, they were much more interested in you know in engaging and so I think it's you know you have to nobody's going to take the time to explain it to you when you go into a new world you have to take the time but but actually it can be fun it's doing exactly as you do it's trying to dissect out what's peripheral and what's central to you know, what makes this person tick, what makes, you know, how, how is policy, how is policy formed? And actually, nobody could tell you that it's, it's not an exact science, but you can get the idea of it. And once you've got the idea of it, then you're at least not exactly on an equal footing, because you're still an amateur, but you're on some sort of footing to be able to, to then 
nibble away at things and and to be to, to have your voice more more loudly heard I guess so yeah but it takes a long time <laughs> thanks it's really really interesting on behalf of all of us here at SFAM we're very proud um, to bestow these uh, awards upon you today and also to have you as part of our uh, SFAM wider family so thank you very much again and congratulations to you both Thank you very much. And thanks to the panel for all your questions. <laughs> yeah, th thanks very much, Brendan. And I, I, I'd like to thank, I'm just thinking that if this is an example, or, well, you know, Nikki, Matt and Zena, if you're an example of early career scientists, I think science is safe in your hands. <laughs> <laughs>